This chapter starts our study of business entities, and in this particular chapter, we're going to cover sole proprietorships and partnerships. Sole proprietorships are the easiest business organization to form. All you really have to do is go out and start performing a service for money. You don't have to formally incorporate. You don't have to formally file anything. You pretty much have to just go out there and start providing a service. The only time you would have to file something would be if you are using a name other than your own. So you might have to file a DBA doing business as certificate with your county. And despite what we feel like that everybody is a corporation, most businesses in America are sole proprietorships. 73% of all businesses in America are sole proprietorships. And according to the U.S. Small Business Administration, 47.5% of all U.S. employees work for small businesses. So a small business isn't necessarily a sole proprietorship, but a small business is defined by the SBA on a sliding scale depending on what, on what industry you're in, but it could be less than 250 up to less than 1,500 employees. So really, business in America isn't only concentrated in large corporations. It's concentrated really in sole proprietorships and other forms of small business. There are some advantages to forming a sole proprietorship. First, it the owner has complete control over the business, right? With a partnership or a corporation or something else, an owner still has somebody to answer to, but not with a sole proprietorship. Also, the owner keeps all the profits. They don't have to split them anywhere. And a sole proprietorship is really easy to form. Like I said, you basically just have to go out there and start providing a service and collecting money or start selling things and collecting money. There are disadvantages. The owner is subject to unlimited liability. What this means is if I have a business, say I'm performing legal work and I'm just performing it as a sole proprietor. So I go out and I perform legal work and I mess something up. Well, I can be sued, and as a sole proprietor, when I'm sued, if I lose, not only can I lose business assets, I can lose all of my personal assets as well. My home, my car, anything I own is subject to suit and subject to seizure. The sole proprietorship's existence depends entirely upon the sole proprietor. You can't really transfer a sole proprietorship. It's solely person-dependent. And then owners often find it difficult to raise a lot of cash quickly because it depends on someone loaning money to a single person. And a lot of times banks and other investors aren't willing to do that. All right, another disadvantage that isn't mentioned on this slide is the taxation. And the taxation can be an advantage or it can be a disadvantage. So Sole proprietorships have flow through taxation, which means that all the income from that the sole proprietor earns is taxed on that sole proprietor's individual income tax return at their highest tax rate. So that could be great if, it, if you are a sole proprietor who doesn't have a very high tax rate because your sole proprietorship does not earn a ton of money. But if it does earn a ton of money, you are going to be taxed at a higher rate than if you were a C-Corp. All right, moving on to partnerships. Partnerships are governed under either the Uniform per Partnership Act or the newer Revised Uniform Partnership Act. Excuse me. And the Revised Uniform Partnership Act clarifies the nature of a partner's interest in the partnership property. It explains the duties partners have in relation to one another, and it gives partners the power to pursue a remedy when those duties are violated. It generally, the revised act generally gives partnerships more of a continued existence. So before, under the Uniform Partnership Act, any time a partner left, the partnership automatically dissolved. Well, under the revised Uniform Partnership Act, that's not necessarily true. It gives continu continuity of life to the partnership. It also solves one of the most troubling problems of the old partnership structure, that of joint and several liability, which we're going to talk about that in, a, in the next few slides. So um, the act that applies in the state where you do business is the act under which you will be governed. So some states still use the Uniform Partnership Act and some use the revised Uniform Partnership Act. A partnership is an association of two or more persons to carry on as co-owners 
of a business for profit. So it's similar to a sole proprietorship in that two people generally get together and start a business and they start engaging in activities for profit. It is smart to have a partnership agreement written and in place and agreed upon. It is not legally necessary to do that to be a partnership. Really the only thing that is required is that there are two or more people and they carry on a business for profit. People doesn't have to mean individual people. It can be a corporation, a joint venture, an LLC, something like that. There are two theories of partnerships, entity and aggregate. The Uniform Partnership Act, which remember is the, the old act, there was room to dispute whether a partnership would be considered an entity or an aggregate. So depending on what we were talking about, it really depended on how we treated the organization. So under the entity theory, a partnership exists as an individual person with its own separate identity. So the partnership is its own entity. It's separate from the identity of the partners. All right, under the aggregate theory, the partnership is seen simply as an assembly or collection of the partners who do business together. So under the revised Uniform Partnership Act, a partnership is considered an entity in most situations, but not all. So a partnership that is defined as an entity, it may own title to property in the partnership name, it can sue and be sued under the partnership name, and it can have its own separate bank account. All right, some traditional forms of business are listed here. We've talked about the sole proprietorship, and we have talked about partnerships in the general sense. So a general partnership is what we have defined already. Two or more persons engaged in business together for profit. A limited partnership is still two or more persons engaged in business for profit, but now there's at least one general partner and one limited partner. The limited partner has limited liability. That means the limited partner, if, if the partnership is sued, may only lose up to their investment in the partnership. They can't lose their house, their car, things like that. A limited liability partnership, or an LLP, has limited liability for all partners. So if the partnership messes up, they can't lose their home and their personal assets. There are limitations to this, however. In a limited liability partnership, an individual partner who, who messes something up and is sued can lose their own personal assets. But in a limited liability partnership, the partner who did not mess up, the partner who is only associated with this error by virtue of being a partner with someone else has limited liability for his or her own personal assets. So if I am engaged in the practice of law and it's me and partner A, and then we have partner B. Partner B does something negligent and the client sues the partnership and partner B. So partner B can lose his personal assets, his or her personal assets, because partner B is the one who is negligent. Me, partner A, I cannot lose my personal assets. I can lose any investment I've made in the partnership. So that is the, that is the difference in a limited liability partnership. All right, then there's a private corporation, which is an entity formed by private persons to carry out a task best undertaken by an organization. It can raise large amounts of capital quickly, and it can grant the protection of limited liability. There's a public corporation, which is an entity set up by the federal, state, or local government for governmental purposes, and it usually involves the public health, safety, or welfare. There is a quasi-public corporation, which is a privately organized entity that makes a profit but provides a service on which the public depends. There's a limited liability corporation, which is an LLC. It's kind of similar to a partnership and a corporation. It takes the best of both of those entities. So it has flow through taxation, which a partnership has, meaning we don't have double taxation. We don't have to worry about double taxation. It, we flow through, the, the profits flow through and are taxed at the individual level. But it provides limited liability for all members of the LLC. A joint venture is something that involves a contractual arrangement by which individuals unite for a limited amount of time to create a new entity 
in which the founders share control, expenses, and profits. And finally, a franchise is a business arrangement that permits an individual, a group of investors, or another entity to lease the right to use a parent entity's business operation, trademark, goods, services, and goodwill under a fee arrangement provided by that parent. So these are the traditional forms of business. There's also these non-traditional forms of business. We don't hear about these nearly as often. The first is a failure-proof public corporation. It's an entity operated by an autonomous board of directors owned by the state and protected from failure by the government. There's a public-private corporation. That's an entity that's owned and operated by the state but is not protected from failure by the government. There's a cross-owned corporation, which is a business entity that's a public corporation owned and operated by another public corporation. There's a public bodies corporation, which would not be a single corporation, but would involve a project that would transform public corporations, making them into profit-making entities. A social corporation is an entity run by a diverse board of directors with representatives from the employees, the state, and the general public. And then these next three are cooperatives. And cooperatives generally are business entities that are owned or operated by usually employees or patrons of the corporation. All right, so that's a general co-op. We might think of if you live in a rural area and you get your electric power from a co-op. You know that oftentimes the co-op is owned by the, the patrons, the people who use that service. A co-op cooperative corporation with wage earning employees is one that is owned and operated by the employees who hire non-owner employees to perform work beyond the expertise or availability of the owner employees. And then there's a cooperative with non-employee owners, which is a business entity owned and operated by employees with some non-employee shareholders. You can form a, a partnership in one of two ways. Remember I said you don't really have to do anything formal to form a partnership, and that is the second item listed here, partnership by proof of existence. Individuals would form a partnership because of their method of doing business. So if I go into business with someone else and I share profits, I have then formed a partnership without any formal documentation. I could also form a partnership by contract, which is an express agreement drawn up by the partners, and that would be called the Articles of Partnership. This isn't required, but it is a very smart thing to do if you're going to go in business with someone else to have an agreement by which to operate that business. It really protects both of you in the future. One of the most common ways to do this, to form a partnership, is by an express agreement. It can be oral, but best practices would be to write that down so that everything is spelled out. The way to split profits, the way to split losses, the way to allocate different items of income, what might cause dissolution, things like that. The written agreement that established the partnership is going to be called the partnership agreement. The Revised Uniform Partnership Act defines the partnership contract as the agreement, whether written, oral, or implied, among the partners concerning the partnership, including amendments to the partnership agreement. All partners should do this, and they should include the following. It is advisable to include the following provisions. The name and duration of the partnership. So it could be it could be terminable, it could be for a term of years. We could form a partnership for a term of three years to complete a project or it could be an indefinite life partnership. It should include the names of the partners, the amount of capital that each partner has contributed to the partnership, which means, of course, the amount of the initial contribution and any subsequent, subsequent contributions to the partnership by each partner, the character and the extent of the business of the partnership, the way the profits will be divided. So we always think profits should be divided equally, and we can do that, but you could also form a partnership where someone has a really limited role and therefore they don't get 50-50 of the profits. They may get 5% and you might get 95%. It should address the way any losses will be shared because losses don't always have to be shared the same way profits are shared. If there is no provision specifying a difference, then losses will be allocated in the same way as profits, but you can change that in the agreement. The duties of the partners, any limitations based on the partners, a section on salaries, if we're going to pay salaries, 
an explanation of the dissolution process, if it would be different from anything in the Revised Uniform Partnership Act, and a provision for determining the value of a partner's interest in the partnership. One important thing to note here is that even if you live in a state covered by the Re Revised Uniform Partnership Act or just the Uniform Partnership Act, you don't have to agree to use all of those provisions. So the provisions of each of those acts are default provisions. But most of those provisions you can contract around and you can change them. Not everyone, but most of those provisions can be changed by contract. To form a partnership by proof of existence, you only have to point to these three factors, an association of two or more persons that are co-owners and they operate for profit. Very simple. All right, next, per partnership property rights and duties. So it's important when we're talking about a partnership to first determine what's partnership property and what is just property of the individual partners. And then we need to know what we can do with that. What are our rights and duties with that property? So it's an ex extremely critical element in partnership law because virtually every decision made by a partner deals with the disposition of partnership property. Capital contributions are defined as sums that are contributed by the partners as permanent investments and that the partners are entitled to have returned when the partnership is dissolved. Okay, so that's going to be different than maybe a loan a partner would make to the partnership. And both often happen. If a partner makes a loan to a partnership, that is not a contribution to the partnership and that is that gives the partner right to be compensated as soon as the, the money is, is received by the partnership, not only in dissolution, but during the life of the partnership. Partnership liability can be joint liability or joint and several liability. Under the original Uniform Partnership Act, partners were jointly liable for contract obligations, but jointly and severally liable for any tort obligations. But under the Revised Uniform Partnership Act, liability was altered so that joint and several liability applies to suits in both contract and tort law. So under joint liability, when partners are sued, the liability will be spread equally among them. But in joint and several liability, the partners can be sued apart or together. And so under joint and several liability, oftentimes both will happen. A client will be angry and a client will, will sue the... AB partnership and also partner A and partner B in their individual liability in their individual capacity. And partnership property is of course defined as any and all property that has been obtained by the partnership itself. Sometimes it's difficult to know if something is partnership property or just individual partner property. Courts often ask the following questions: Has the partnership included the property in its account books? Has the partnership expended its own funds to improve or repair the property? Has the partnership paid taxes on the property? Has the partnership paid other expenses, such as maintenance costs for the property? And the more of those questions that can be answered yes, the more likely it's going to be partnership property. If property is partnership property, a partner isn't a co-owner of that property and they have no interest in that property that can be transferred or severed either voluntarily or involuntarily. If it's partnership property, it belongs solely to the partnership, which means the partners can use the partnership property, but their right to hold and use it is limited to partnership purposes. Okay, so that means if I am a 50-50 partnership and my partnership owns a building, I'm not a 50% owner of that building. The partnership owns the building. I can use the building in my partnership capacity, but not in my individual capacity. A partner has an interest in a partnership under the Revised Uniform Partnership Act, and that interest has two parts, a transferable economic interest and a non-transferable interest in management, meaning as a partner, I am free to transfer my right to profits to anyone at any time or my right to losses. 
I, however, cannot transfer my right to management without dissolving the partnership. The surplus of partnership funds include any funds that remain after the partnership has been dissolved and all other debts and prior obligations have been paid. So um, this is another thing, an economic interest in the partnership. I am free to assign a surplus. I am not free to assign management rights. Manage of, management of a partnership is generally done by the partners. There are limitations though. A silent partner is a partner, a partner who does not participate in the day-to-day -day business of the firm. Generally, limited partners are silent partners, so they can't participate in the day-to-day -day management of the firm. A secret partner, though, is a partner whose identity and existence are not known outside the firm, but that person can participate in the management of the firm. A partnership has the following rights and duties. A partnership has the right to use partnership property as long as the property is held and used for partnership purposes. It has the right to receive the partner's share of the profits and losses and his or her share of the surplus and the right to manage the regular day-to-day -day operation of the partnership business. Also, a partner has the right to approve of serious matters outside the ordinary course of business and the right to approve of, min of amendments to the partnership agreement. And generally, the Uniform Partnership Act or the Revised Uniform Partnership Act will spell out how amendments can be approved. And of course, that's another thing we can change by contract, but it has general basic provisions in there. Partners also generally have enforcement rights, and under the Revised Uniform Partnership Act, those have been enhanced. Um, they have the right to see the firm's financial records, the right to compel an accounting, and the right to compel a dissolution of the entire partnership. So under the Revised Uniform Partnership, these rights are retained, but in addition, a partner can sue another partner directly under the entity theory, and the partnership... It, it can also sue the partnership itself to enforce his or her partnership rights as expressed in the Revised Uniform Partnership Act or granted by the partnership agreement. The partners have three duties that can not be put off by contract. So these duties can, will survive any alterations. They must exist in the, the partnership agreement. The duty of loyalty, the duty of obedience, and the duty of due care. The duty of loyalty includes the following. To account to the partnership for any property, profits, or benefit that comes from the partner's use of partnership property or from the winding up process after dissolution. So if I, in my part, if I use partnership property and I lend it out, I rent it out, and I get money for, for that, I have to account for that to the partnership. I have to turn over those profits to the partnership. I have to refrain from dealing with people who may have an interest that is adverse to the best interest of the partnership. I have to refrain from entering any competition with the partnership in the operation of partnership business. So if I am a member of a partnership that does construction and I want to start a side business that maybe tangentially relates to construction, I cannot do that. I cannot compete with my partnership because I owe the partnership the duty of loyalty. The duty of care means that the partners must do their best in the business based on their talents, education, and ability. So the duty of due care is going to be different based on the education of the partner. Um, I'm an accountant, so I would be held to a higher duty of due care regarding the financial statements than someone who maybe was an art major. To dissociate with a partnership, that takes place whenever a partner is no longer associated with the running of the firm. Partners are always allowed to leave when they want, but sometimes a partner dissociates wrongfully. He, he, or, her, he or she leaves wrongfully when they don't have the legal right to do so. A partner's right to withdraw from a partnership may depend on whether the partnership is a term partnership or a partnership at will. 
And as we briefly mentioned earlier, a term partnership is one that's been set up to run for a limited amount of time or for a limited purpose. So you set up a partnership to accomplish one task. After that task is complete, the partnership will dissolve. A partnership at will is one that any partner may leave without liability, and it is it continues on in existence. All right, so the following will cause a dissociation of a partnership. A partner's death would cause a dissociation of a partnership in either a term partnership or a partnership at will. A partner's leave taking from a partnership will cause dissociation from a partnership at will. A partner's leave taking from either type of partnership under the rules set up by the partnership agreement. So in my partnership agreement, I can set it up on a term partnership that if a partner leaves in a term partnership, that can cause the partnership to, to terminate, or I can put in place provisions that say it will not cause the partnership to terminate. Or a partner is leaving the partnership from either type of partnership if a court has decided that a partner cannot do what he or she is supposed to do under the partnership agreement. Disillusion occurs when a partner ceases to be associated with the partnership and the partnership ends. So dissolution of a partnership can occur in one of three ways. An action committed by the partners, by operation of law, or by the decree of a court of law. All right, again, it can happen by an action of the partners. Uh, the partners can decide they want to dissolve the partnership. It can happen by operation of law by a court order, and by winding up of the partnership's business. So if the courts consider an action harmful to a partnership, they will make that end by a court order or by operation of law. That would be failure to contribute urgently needed capital, stealing partnership property to pay personal debts, constant quarrels, intoxication and gambling, um, because determining which actions are harmful to a partnership is by nature subjective and difficult for courts Advisors suggest that partners include in the written partnership agreement provisions for which they could expel a partner or dissolve the partnership. Okay, and a registered LLP, we kind of briefly touched on this as well. In, an, in a registered LLP, partners can no longer be held jointly or severally liable for the torts, wrongful acts, negligence, or misconduct committed by another partner or by any representative of the partnership. You find registered LLPs often in service businesses. So doctors, lawyers, accountants, these types of people form registered LLPs. And like we mentioned earlier, this is a good form of business for those types of professionals because it limits liability for negligent actions by another partner. So I can't lose my home or my car or any of my personal assets because my partner committed a tort or a wrongful act. If I commit a wrongful act, however, I can still be personally liable. A limited partnership is a partnership formed by two or more persons having at least one general partner and at least one limited partner. I can have more than one of each, but I have to have at least a general partner and at least a limited partner. So again, the limited partner has limited liability, limited to their own investment in the partnership. The general partner takes an active part in the management of the firm and has unlimited liability for the firm's debts. The limited partner, like we said, has limited liability, but in return, they can't participate in the management of the partnership. So they're a non-participating -participating investor.